at the end. I'm gonna I'm going to introduce everybody who's going to be here, even though everybody might not be here yet. That's Representative Greta Bowers it should be here shortly. Representative Julie Gonzalez. Yeah, Representative Jessica Gonzalez. Uh, Julie Johnson will be here shortly. Representative Carl Sherman is with us. And then we have Rose Rayo attending on behalf of Senator Nathan Johnson and Melanie Marks attending on behalf of Representative Jared Patterson. Representative Gonzalez, I apologize. I've only interviewed you a thousand times. <laughs> and then what we're going to do first is we're going to hear from all of the partners, their priorities, what's important to them, what they need from the legislature. So we are going to begin with Stacey Malcolmson. She served as the president and CEO of the Senior Source for the past four years. In the 15 years, Stacey has worked in leadership roles at Dallas Area Habitat for Humanity, United Way of Metropolitan Dallas, and SMU. She has demonstrated expertise in strategic planning, fundraising, and marketing. Prior to entering the nonprofit world, she honed her marketing skills at Frito-Lay. Stacy earned a BA from the University of Texas at Austin and an MBA from Harvard Business School. So Stacy, we'll hear from you first. Thank you, Julie. Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. I first want to thank our partners in today, Visiting Nurses Association, the Dallas Area Gerontological Society, Secure Our Senior Safety, and the Alzheimer's Association. There's so much power in fighting collectively on behalf of seniors. We are so pleased to host this important legislative forum and are honored to have the elected officials here who care about older adults and the issues that impact their quality of life. As a Dallas-based nonprofit serving 25,000 older adults and family caregivers a year through programs and services that address the financial and emotional well-being, the Senior Source has a unique imperative to advocate on behalf of older adults in Texas. Our comprehensive services that protect, defend, and empower older adults are why advocacy is integral to our mission. We champion support for bills for stronger elder financial protection because our staff see firsthand desperate <coughs> older adults who have been scammed out of their life savings. We fight tireless for the safety of residents in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. We advocate for fair pay for adult protective services workers who help ensure the financial and physical safety of our older adults. And unfortunately, these needs keep growing. We are proud that improved laws, protections, and resources resulting from our efforts have a lasting impact on today's and tomorrow's older adults across Texas. We are currently focused on five critical priority areas in the 88th legislative session. The first one is elder financial abuse protection. Elder financial abuse is rampant in Texas and across the country. Older adults lose more than $50 billion each year to frauds, scams, and exploitation. And for every reported case, there are 44 cases that go unreported. Legislative action that holds perpetrators accountable and strengthens protections for vulnerable older adults is needed, including support for APS and the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services. Our second priority is long-term care facility resident protection. Texas consistently ranks as one of the worst states in the country when it comes to quality of care for residents in long-term care facilities. These vulnerable, isolated individuals deserve better treatment and protection at this stage in their lives. COVID-19 has am amplified many of the flaws in resident care, and there are opportunities in this legislative session to improve some of these issues and strengthen the care and protection of long-term care residents. Our third priority is housing. Older adults who rely on rental housing have seen an increase in housing costs. Dallas year of the year, rent costs lead the state average of an 8.3% increase. Efforts supporting eviction legal aid and the Tenant Protection Act are vitally important in this legislative session. Third, fourth are, is food, food security for older, older adults. Food insecurity for older adults across the state has only increased since the beginning of COVID. We should be making it easier for older Texans and those with disabilities to access SNAP benefits 
and meal programs like Meals on Wheels across the state. And finally, Medicaid expansion. Across the 50 states, Texas has the highest number and percentage of uninsured citizens. Medicaid expansion will provide health insurance coverage up to 1.5 million Texans non Medicare eligible. So since 1961, the Senior Source believes that every individual deserves to grow older with dignity and access to resources and services needed. You can help us join our effort and sign up for text or email alerts on key advocacy issues during this legislative session. So you can see up here if you text Senior Source to 52886, uh, it will you fill out your name and address information, and then when we have important bills to Cover, it will send you an alert and those automatically go to your legislators where they at the state level, city, county. Of course, this spring we'll be focusing primarily on the state. But we're excited for all of you to join us in our efforts today. And as Linda Ender used to say and remind us, democracy is not a spectator sport. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce the Alzheimer's Association. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give me your props. Mark Denson is the executive director of the Alzheimer's Association Dallas at Northeast Chapter. In this role, he leads the organization's operations, including program and service delivery, public policy, DEI, marketing and development, and community engagement. His advocacy efforts for those dealing with Alzheimer's disease and other dementia have led to elevated awareness and support for individuals engaged in caregiving and those providing assistance and <clears throat> excuse me, managing the welfare of individuals dealing with the disease. Prior to his role with the Alzheimer's Association, Mark held senior level positions in the public health space and within the NVHA sector. His professional experience within the voluntary health arena has led to organizational outcomes that support our communities and individuals who are dealing with life altering health conditions. His professional experience and interest in building stronger communities has aided multiple organizations in numerous communities. Mark holds a Bachelor of Business Studies, Marketing, and a Certificate in Nonprofit Management. Thank you so much. Just want to make sure I get my slide correct. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see so many good friends and uh, individuals who are uh, in, uh, interested in our elder population. Uh, my name is Mark Denzen, and I am the executive director of the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, I appreciate the interest in the critical issues that affect elder adults here in Texas. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our partners, uh, the, uh, the Dallas Area Gerontological Society, Secure Our Senior Safety, the Senior Source, and Visiting Nurses Association of Texas, who, like the Alzheimer's Association, believe strongly that it's important to be good stewards of our aging population. The mission of the Alzheimer's Association is to lead the way to end Alzheimer's disease and all other dementias. Accelerating global research, driving risk reduction, and early detection, and maximizing quality care are important pillars to help those who are dealing with this devastating disease. The mission, uh, excuse me, uh, I, uh, I'd like to take a moment to break down each of these parts. First, let's look at accelerating global research. There are over 6 million Americans currently living with Alzheimer's disease, and over 11 million family members, friends, and neighbors providing them with unpaid care. Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death, and it is the only leading cause of death for which there is no, not currently um, a cure or a treatment. One of the most commonly held myths about Alzheimer's disease is that it is a normal part of aging, which of course is false. This is a progressive and fatal disorder affecting an estimated one in 10 seniors over the age of 65 and upwards of one in three seniors over the age of 80. The term Alzheimer's and dementia are often used interchangeably. Dementia is an umbrella term that Alzheimer's being the most common form of dementia. Our organization provides support for individuals living with any form of dementia. We know that certain sectors of our population are at greater risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Women make up one third 
of those living with Alzheimer's. And our Hispanic and Black seniors are 1.5 and 2 times more likely, respectively, than their white counterparts to develop the disease. The Alzheimer's Association is currently pouring $3.10 million into 950 research projects in 48 countries. Make no mistake, we are committed to ending the disease. The second element of our mission is driving risk reduction and early de detection. Research has revealed that there are some things that we can do to lower our risk of develop developing dementia. Lifestyle changes including exercise, diet, so socialization, cognitive stimulation, and getting enough sleep are just a few factors shown to have a positive impact on good brain health. For those com communities heavily impacted by cardiovascular disease and diabetes, we're working especially hard to raise awareness of the positive impact these factors have on long-term brain health across the lifespan. Just as any disease process, early detection is critical. Medications and treatments are more effective in the early stages. It allows an individual the opportunity to actively participate in the planning for the future and affords them the opportunity to access potentially life-saving clinical trials, should they wish. We are working with health care providers to implement system change in order to improve the detection and diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And finally, maximizing quality care and support. We offer support 24 hours a day, seven days a week through our helpline. We train volunteers to, to lead support groups throughout our communities. We provide free education and help caregivers and the general public have a greater understanding of the disease and how best to support it. We offer early stage socialization programs for individuals in the early stages of Alzheimer's and their care partners. We provide care consultation services for families needing greater guidance and support along their journey. And we have a robust online resource resource guide, including the Alls Connected Community Message Board that allows people from around the world to ask questions, learn from one another, and realize that they're not alone. One of the most significant ways we work to ensure quality care and support for those living with Alzheimer's and their, their caregivers is through public change, policy change. Excuse me. The amazing work of our volunteer advocates and public policy staff, many of which are here today, provides a powerful collective voice for the families impacted by dementia. Now let's take a look at the important priorities critical to the needs of elder adults uh, and what our elected officials see as focus areas in the upcoming legislative session. Priorities this session include increase the investment of Alzheimer's care and support. During the past two biennium, the Texas legislator increased its commitment to Alzheimer's care and support by appropriating $500,000 a year to Alzheimer's disease with, within the Texas Department of Health Services. Alzheimer's care and support has a profound implication on the Alzheimer's community, leading to higher costs on individuals, our healthcare system, and the government. The Alzheimer's Association is calling on legislators to support an investment of $10 million over the biennium for Alzheimer's care and support at the Texas Department of State Health Services with an emphasis on increasing the early detection and diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and related dimensions throughout the state. For our next priority, we'd like to thank Representative Retta Bowers for uh, including House Bill 568, Dementia Training for Law Enforcement. HB 568, Dementia Training for Law Enforcement, Officers frequently uh, interact with individuals who have Alzheimer's and other dementias in a variety of different settings. Individuals with Alzheimer's have a unique need, requiring additional support to keep them and others safe. With, without adequate training, however, law enforcement officers may not know how to work with people in these situations, leading to more confusion and potentially hostile environments. Enhancing education of disease and training to de-escalate can often uh, effectively address situations and ensure the safety of individuals with dementia as well as those of our first responders. The Alzheimer's Association is working with legislators 
to ensure that all new um, uh, enforcement officers receive dementia training, as well as continuing education for those currently on the job. Lastly, um, enhancing transparency and dementia in long care, in long care uh, units. The number of people with Alzheimer's and dementia in, uh, in various care settings is growing. More than 40% of those individuals uh, uh, in those residential care facilities, such as assisted living, have Alzheimer's or another dementia. Individuals with Alzheimer's have needs that often make care delivery challenging and more demanding on the other residents without Alzheimer's. Individuals with Alzheimer's have, um, excuse me, Alzheimer's enhanced person-centered dementia training and, and those involved in the, the delivery of care can improve the quality uh, of care and experiences of individuals with Alzheimer's and dementia. The cornerstone of providing quality dementia care is to ensure that professional care staff involved in the delivery of the, of the individuals with dementia receive dementia-specific training. Those are the priorities that the Alzheimer's Association is supporting. And again, I want to thank you for being here today. Next, I'd like to introduce Robbie McCullough, a 30-year financial services and insurance veteran with a passion for caregiving. Robbie's personal life experiences and prior work history led him to a lifelong aspiration of building a home care business. He was instrumental in the care and upbringing of his older sister who had Down syndrome. She recently passed away, further stirring his desire to make a personal impact in his local community by allowing those in need with age dignity. Robbie's a graduate of Baylor University. He also holds a certified senior advisor designation proctored by the Society of Senior Advisors Certified Employee Benefits designation through the Wharton School. He's the owner of Assisting Hands Home Care, a nationally recognized agency. He owns two territories as well as the area representative for North Texas. Robbie is currently on the board of directors of the Dallas Area Parkinson Society, serving as the vice president. He is also serving on the Dallas Area Gerontology Society, currently serving as vice president and is the president elect for 2023. Good morning, folks. Um, I'm here to represent, like, like Julie said, um, the DAGS, Dallas Area Gerontology Society, a nonprofit that specifically targets education. And as uh, we've all spoken about how important seniors are to our community, um, that education of how to deal with the more clinical side of aging is critical. And we are specifically uh, founding. Uh, scholarships every year. This year I believe we have $15,000 away to 15 students all across North Texas from SMU to TCU just to further that study of gerontology, which we all recognize is very, very important for our community. Study of aging is a very specific, unique uh, hospitals all across North Texas. UT Southwestern is a really specific partner of ours, but our nonprofit board has been around since about, I think, 15, 17 years is a very diverse board on purpose, from clinical people to non-clinical people like myself. Our elder, elder, our elder care attorney is here in the room. Very diverse to understand and try to represent the community as a whole. So when we go out to propose scholarships and those students, that we really cover as many bases as possible, okay? Um, annually, we just had our big symposium fall forum at the Moody Library of 190, 200 folks there, unbelievable speakers, really good reviews. Uh, next year we're looking for a new site, but we're very excited about being part of that. Social worker, our social worker guru is here. So uh, we perform CEs every every month, pretty much. So it's the Thursday, third Thursday every month from 245 to 345. You're all welcome to come, okay? Uh, the DAGS is a great program. We're very proud of it. Long history, and we're very excited to be here to further represent uh, those great senior communities so we can help them all age with dignity and grace. Thank you. Shannon Dion, 
Khan is the daughter of Doris Gleason, who in 2016 was murdered by Billy Shamir Mayor. Shannon is passionate about elder safety and is a co-founder of Secure Our Senior Safety SOSS. The goals of SOSS are to ensure legislation is passed to improve senior security at residential establishments and increase awareness of vulnerability in elders. Good morning, everyone. I'm Shannon Dion. I'm president of Secure Our Senior Safety, SOSS. And I need to change it here. Okay, there we go. Uh, I want to thank you all so much for coming this morning and hearing these important ideas, thoughts, representatives, and staff. I know this is an incredibly busy time for you. You're on fast pace. So thank you. And to be a part of this group, I, I thank Senior Source for in including us and giving us this opportunity. SOSS was formed in the fall of 2019 because of the convicted serial killer Billy Shamir Mir, stalking, smothering to death, and stealing from vulnerable, vulnerable seniors. Most of his homicides were committed in independent senior living communities. He is currently serving two life without parole sentences for capital murder. He was indicted for 22 murders here in North Texas, but law enforcement believes the number is much higher. Some of you may remember SOSS from the 87th session. Senator Nathan Johnson, Rose Ware, she's with Nathan Johnson. Senator Nathan Johnson and Representative Julie Johnson, who will be joining us in a bit, and Representative Jared Patterson, Melanie, thank you for being with us, presented four bills for us. We are pleased that two of these bills passed. HB 1132 increased the number of spot checks on cash for gold businesses. This hopefully will discourage and decrease the crime in that market. The second bill, Maryland's law, requires medical examiners to notify families when a death certificate is amended. One of our families learned through Facebook Messenger that their mother had been murdered. We are returning to Austin asking for support to improve senior security and protect the vulnerable. We learned last session if a bill is simple, common sense, and doesn't have a fiscal note, it stands a good chance of passing. <laughs> and these are our five priorities. We ask that visitors sign in and are identified with name tags. The serial murderer wandered for hours, unidentified in these living establishments, not identified. This should not occur if visitors are expected to wear name tags. Background checks are required for workers at properties. I believe this is self-explanatory. Criminal activity at properties is shared with residents. At my mother's independent senior living establishment, she was the un seventh unattended death in three and a half months. Residents were not notified of this activity of the other unattended deaths, not informed of a trespasser, and were discouraged from discussing their suspicions amongst themselves or with the staff. Community awareness would have saved lives. We also ask that law enforcement is given access to residents when investigating. In 2018, when detectives were limited in their ability to investigate, one detective was escorted off a property and informed, do not return unless you have subpoenas and warrants. Another detective asked to speak with residents and he was denied. He asked to leave his contact information for residents and that was also denied. In neighborhoods, officers are permitted to canvas. This should also be allowed in the senior living establishments. In our last one, forced arbitration clauses should be removed from leases for personal injury cases. Arbitration is a reasonable remedy for many disputes, but not physical injury. Currently, six murder victim families in the same establishment are denied the right to sue in court because of an arbitration clause in the lease that their parents had signed. We understand 100% prevention 
the prom is an unrealistic goal. Our goal at Secure Our Senior Safety is deterrence, awareness, and fairness for residents and their families. Our priorities will not result in fees paid by the state. We are simply asking for reasonable oversight, protection, and upholding the constitutional right to be heard in court. As we, the baby boomers age, and the senior population grows, independent living residences also increase in popularity. This is a booming industry. They provide a target-rich environment for criminals. And as a U.S. Assistant District Attorney told me one time, criminals have one job. They are looking to find vulnerabilities to take advantage of. Let's stop the criminals from preying on our vulnerable. It's time to care for those who care for us. Thank you all very much. Catherine Krause, President and CEO of DMA, joined the Visiting Nurse Association in May 2009 and has most recently served as Chief Administrative Officer and Vice President of the Visiting Nurse Association Meals on Wheels. Before coming to Visiting Nurse Association, Catherine served as Executive Vice, Vice President of Advocacy and Programs at the National Headquarters of the American Heart Association, which included oversight of AHA's Advocacy Office in Washington, D.C. Previously, she was Regional Director of Home Medical Support Services, directing operations for eight home health agencies in four states. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Biology from New Mexico State University and an MBA from Southern Methodist University right here in Dallas. Yeah. Thank you, Carolyn. Karen, we're sorry for your loss. And the article that you had a picture of, of the AARP, the Texas Elder Murders, um, Apple News picked that up yesterday and I read that yesterday and you know it's been in the Dallas Morning News many times and so hopefully you all have been reading that and um, Kara Reynoldson's here and a huge advocate for supporting seniors but um, it's it's astounding but not astounding uh, my mom's in assisted living can't talk and it's in a wheelchair you know so you know, vulnerable to be up we shouldn't have been performing with this <laughs> it's very hard it's, the people that you are here today supporting are visible many times, and you um, you are their advocates. There are very few advocates for seniors the way you are, and they are an invisible group. And if you read this article, you'll see that um, it's just astounding how people want to push aside. You know, just think as we all get older. older you're invisible. You become invisible. You're not an attractive young Dallas. You know, you're not an attractive young, you know, doer. And you can just decide. Okay, now on to DNA. So again, I'm, I'm. Well, let me just yeah. Another part of the podcast. There's a podcast too. Um, but certainly, as the senior source, thank you for hosting this. As the senior source has, you know, a text that goes out and that we know where to support you. Um, at, you know, for the bills, and we have bills that we're interested in as well. But we would, I'm sure, all of us be very interested in whatever you're doing to be able to support. We have, um, how about Chris, who is our vice president of a lot of things? We, how many volunteers do we have that could be activated? Oh. 10,000. 10, so, and we have them all on, um, you know, emails, etc. So please make sure that you connect with us and let us know. And, and thank you for, 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 for all of you for the support of the seniors as well. Okay. I know I stand between you and uh, legislators, so let, I'll make this quick. Um, 1934, DNA was started 88 years ago. Um, by two women, a public health nurse and the wife of a local rabbi, um, Sadie Lefkowitz. And she, like herself, saw an issue in the community uh, before Medicare, Medicaid, government programs, and there were people in depression who 
seats. The hospital access was limited. Um, so th these women organized the Visiting Nurse Association. Um, it's a standalone nonprofit, um, but there are different visiting nurse associations across the country. But they were all created early on in this uh, country to really take care of the <coughs> seniors. And we we um, took care of the whole spectrum at one time, um, uh, from cradle to grave, basically. But now what we do is focus primarily on seniors. You know, in the market specialized, as you've seen in healthcare, and right now, uh, our mission is to help people age with dignity and independence uh, in people's homes. And we do that in four ways, um, from primarily we serve about um, 10,000 people a year, but we uh, about 7,000 people on Meals on Wheels. We do take care of people every day, delivering home-delivered meals. We delivered over 1.1 million home-delivered meals. Uh, in Dallas County last year, as well as uh, meals in congregate centers. Again, at Chris, we have how many congregate centers? 31. 31 congregate centers, and we are basically serving uh, uh, congregate style feeding for those folks as well. Uh, yeah, that's my thing. I'm used to having more help. <laughs> I can only do one thing at one time. Okay, uh, then we are um, also. Uh, the oldest hospice in um, Texas. We started out on the Medicare. Um, this is this is for the meals on wheels, but uh, briefly, the hospice uh, operations. We take care of um, last year over 1,600 patients at end of life. We also have a supportive palliative care uh, operation, uh, which takes care of people uh, prior to hospice that need mainly palliation. And we, during COVID, we started, this is sort of in our wheelhouse, but now we used to do this. We uh, started pediatric hospice because there, was, there are probably 300 hospices in uh, North Texas, of which there was one in Fort Worth with a pediatric hospice. Um, and most, as you can imagine, the children that are on hospice are people, kids that are born with, um, with not a long life expectancy, but mm -hmm. they in contrast with this. So, um, we started that in 2020 in partnership with Children's Center. Um, our priorities. Um, legislative session coming up, our key priority is right now we are paid $5.31 per meal uh, by the state, which we're grateful for. We have a partnership, but we have to match that with charitable funds. We do raise a um, significant amount of money from the uh, community, which is great, uh, obviously a lot of generosity in the community, but um, that has to be matched. What we're asking for is an increase to seven dollars uh, per meal, and um, so we are hoping for that. Um, the other thing is that there are for profit, I used to work in for profit health care. I think there's nothing, I'm not going to make a statement against or for or anything, but I'm, I'm saying that. Organizations have come in and tried to do drop ship to people. You, many of you know that Meals on Wheels is not just a meal. It's the daily visit, the safety check. We have an app that basically you feed back information to say, you know, here are some concerns. And we have a nurse follow up. To drop ship meals, that's not going to happen. It really is. So what we're asking for is support for um, preference for what we do because we save millions of dollars to save we're taking care of person, people in the home and keeping them up in the home, they're not going to cost society good. They're not going to be in a hospital as much as they would be with out in So um, we, we hope that there's uh, efforts to afford the organization. And so that's up there, but if, you know, would someone change the slide? <laughs> anyway, all right, so there are two uh, hospice bills that we care about. Uh, support House Bill 638. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Anyone have to represent the Don't worry. Oh, now I know. Now I know. Uh, which would allow people with terminal illness to seek drugs to try potentially life altering <coughs> drug products or devices after the trial period. So basically, after we do the trial uh, for 
for devices, biologicals, et cetera. So if the person's terminally ill, it would allow them to access after that trial um, life saving, potential life saving treatment. The second is support House Bill 647, Representative Camposo, uh, which would make amendments to Chapter 166 advanced directives. Uh, it allows pregnant women the right to make decisions on life sustaining treatment and add updates to the health code. So um, it allows uh, a woman who's pregnant to um, make determination during um, or advanced directive during that time. So thank you for being here, and I look forward to hearing from you. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for your presentations. I'm going to go through again the list and the staff that are here today. We are going to start with Representative Sherman. Uh, everybody's kind of got some time constraints, so we may go out of order here, so just bear with us. But again, we have Representative Carl Sherman. We have Representative Julie Johnson. Representative Jessica Gonzalez. <laughs> Representative um, Retta Andrews Bowers, and we have staff, Rose Rayo attending on behalf of Senator Nathan Johnson, Melanie Marks attending on behalf of Representative Jared Patterson, also, which I neglected to add, we have two staff attending from U.S. Congresswoman-elect Jasmine Crockett's office, Tony Bryan and Gavin Nicholson, so thanks for being here. We know this is a really busy time for everybody right now, getting back, ready to go back to Washington, getting ready to go back to Austin. So thank you all so much for being here. And you just heard from organizations that expect a lot. We're hoping for a lot from you all. So you're up first, Representative Sherman. Thank you, Julie Fine. Uh, I think it's pieces. Okay. Thank you, Julie Fine, uh, for, uh, okay for moderating this very important uh, gathering. Uh, I think it's important that we understand uh, that if you live long enough, getting old is inevitable, but growing up is optional. And when I consider sometimes uh, some of the issues that we uh, discuss with great contention uh, in the Texas House, uh, I, I lose a little faith in uh, the uh, uh, growing up part. Uh, the issues that you bring forth are very important uh, to us. And uh, obviously, having a diverse representation here uh, from uh, certainly Representative Patterson's office, Melanie here, uh, and others that are concerned about these important issues. I think you will find on this panel uh, individuals who will focus on the priorities that you have laid out. Uh, certainly, uh, increasing the allotment from five to seven uh, seems uh, doable to me with an additional 30 billion uh, in appropriations and surplus, uh, 13 billion in the rainy day fund. Uh, my uh, deskmate here, former deskmate, Julie Fine and I, uh, certainly uh, Mike Taylor, we uh, we find these issues to be extremely important. I think we might need Julie Johnson. Julie Johnson. Oh, I said Julie Fine, didn't you? Yeah. Well, we Julie spent a Fine. lot of time together every day. Okay. He's a frequent flyer on my show. Catherine, that's correct. Julie is fine. Uh, <laughs> Julie Johnson uh, and I uh, certainly uh, these these matters are of concern to us. Now I was taking some notes on uh, each of the speakers from Stacy, Mark, Robbie, Shannon, Catherine, uh, and I found one central theme was uh, your mission is that we age with dignity, and I think for us. Uh, as your elected officials, we understand that whatever comes forward, whether it be the enactment of COLA or retired teachers who are part of our age population, uh, that is policy. That's public policy. That speaks to really our heart. And so uh, I hope that you will uh, not only continue to do uh, forums like this, that you 
I do, and we're always so happy to be a part of. Uh, but that you continue to come down to the Capitol and work together in collaboration uh, as you're doing, because that makes a difference. Uh, Senator Johnson uh, is really focused on Medicaid expansion, and we are too, uh, in the House, uh, and we will continue to push forward. I would think that this has to be the year that we can do it. At the end of the day, uh, our legislative priorities should be congruent with, uh, I believe, uh, our Savior's uh, priorities. Uh, and when he talks about taking care of the elderly, I take that serious. I take that very serious. Jesus never says, give him a tax break. So we have to make sure that these issues that are germane to the quality of life, meals on wheels, uh, I just can't imagine delivering packages because so much of this is a part of the conversation and building relationship when you provide those meals. As a former mayor, I participated in DNAs, Meals on Wheels. And finally, I'll, I'll have to say this uh, because I know that, Julie, you've been very considerate. Uh, I, I do have to leave. Uh, but a couple of years ago, I was on a radio program. The DJ invited me on this talk show, Julie, and uh, I get there. And it's like one of those, I think it's going to be one of those gotcha shows. I've been on different shows like Mark Davis. And, things. and uh, he starts off the interview and he says, um, do you know why I invited you here? And I thought, you know, maybe it's because, you know, I took my company public as a young man, trading on the NASDAQ in the U.S. and Frankfurt Exchange in Europe. Or maybe it was when I had the opportunity to serve as mayor and city manager uh, for one year uh, at the same time. And he said, I invited you on here because you used to visit my mother in a nursing home. Every week, you would visit her. And I just thought that was so nice. It's all of our responsibility to make sure that we have a relationship with all citizens. And I want to thank uh, my my legislative director, Don Freeman, who's here. Uh, and uh, I know that I have to go, uh, but I know she will be tentative, uh, tentative to what your concerns are. Thank you so much. I took a lot of notes. God bless you all. Thank you, Representative Freeman. And next, we are going to hear from Representative Johnson. Yeah, yeah this is that time in the session where uh, we, we can't keep ourselves coming and going. And so I had a prior commitment on my way here. Gotta go, and it's just that time, time of where we are getting ready for what's going to be a very important session, especially in our seniors. Um, well, for all Texans, quite frankly. Um, you know, I do a lot of different issues, especially I focus a lot on health care policy. Uh, that's kind of been the, my wheelhouse in the, in the legislature. Uh, I am the House sponsor of the, the primary Medicaid expansion bill along with uh, Senator Johnson. We partner a lot together. Uh, Nathan and I have been friends way before we ever um, got into the legislature. You know, he coached my son's third grade soccer team. And so, <laughs> you know, once you go through something like that, you're, you're, you're bonded for a long time. Uh, but it is exciting to work with them on that. You know, to me, Medicaid expansion is one of the absolute number one priorities uh, for seniors in this state. Um, <laughs> it just touches so many issues from dependent care, you know, the wages we're paying for in-home dependent care is unconscionable. It's $8.25 an hour. And no one is working for $8.25 an hour, especially uh, for that kind of work. That's hard, demanding, um, compassionate work. And, and we have to make that uh, more accessible uh, so that people can um, age and with dignity in their homes as long as possible. You know, that's a 
that certainly is a goal. Um, and so what we need, though, is y'all to get more fired up about Medicaid expansion. You know, what I find is, is what I'm trying to preach everywhere I go is it's fine for you to tell me how important Medicaid expansion is, but you had me before we had our meeting. Um, what I need is for y'all to raise your voices in the most aggressive way possible for this legislature to understand how important it is that we pass this bill. And their voices were too silent last session, to be honest. For the people where it matters the most, we need y'all to engage more and get your people more involved and come and testify on how important this bill and call and demand that we have a hearing and demand that it be put to a vote. We had the votes to pass it on the House floor, but we didn't get leadership to schedule it. So that's where y'all need to come involved, is to start calling and saying, we want this heard. Um, Shannon Dion is my constituent, and uh, I have been blessed to be on a journey with her through her grief over the tragic loss of her mother and what that is about. And so we have a lot of student safety uh, work that we're doing uh, to try to make it safe for seniors to live. And, you know, with the advent of, you know, with Alzheimer's and increased dementia, um, you know, seniors are become a very vulnerable population. And when a facility advertises that they have security and a family relies that they have security and that there's lockdowns and they investigate um, the people that they allow on the property and they fail to do that and people are harmed or killed because of that failure, we intend to hold them accountable for that. Uh, so uh, we had that bill last time. Uh, Shannon came down and testified. I'm filing one of the first things I filed again. Uh, and we will continue to do that because it is one of the most traumatic decisions uh, for a family member to turn the care of their mother or their father, somebody they hold dear, over to others because their care has become too great and they can't take care of it at home, or that, or their parent is still independent enough that they don't need to come in home. There's a balance there, right? But regardless, we want to make sure that they're safe. Just like we want to make sure um, our kids are safe when they go to school. We want to make sure everyone is safe. And so we want to make sure that when facilities um, pull themselves out for certain characteristics, certain things, services, certain safety standards that they provide, that they actually do that. Um, because and unfortunately, in the mother's case, they made those presentations, but they did not actually do that. Um, and so we intend to correct that as well. Um, the tag on Carl Vicola, um, you know, that seems to become, um, uh, that's a big issue. You know, uh, we have all, Democrats have offered COLA adjustments permanent. Uh, Republicans tend to want to just make it a 13th check that seems to be um, uh, a partisan divide issue that we have. Hopefully, um, retired teachers again need to use their collective strong voice to say no to demand a permanent COLA. The 13th check <laughs> is not going to work. It is not sufficient across the board. Um, you know, because the thing that I think most Texans are not aware of is that teachers are not eligible for Social Security. Um, and they think, oh, you have Social Security. And no, no, this is their Social Security. And people don't realize that. They're like, what? They really? And I think, you know, something, there's a loophole, um, something that was brought to my attention the other day that I really wasn't aware of, which we need to figure out how to get this fixed. I think it's, it's more at the federal level. But if you had, uh, if you did a job and you paid into Social Security and you retired, and then let's say you want to be like, I have all this great experience, but let's just take myself, for example. I'm a lawyer. I know a lot about the law. I know a lot about government. Um, I've been to public service. What if I wanted to, uh, I've been to Social Security for 31 years. What if I wanted to say, you know what, I can give back. I would be an awesome government teacher at a high school. If I do that, I forfeit my Social Security. What is that about? That talk about a 
is it? That needs to be something I'll need to report on. I'm just saying because <laughs> that is talk about a desensitization to encourage qualified people to have something to give to <coughs> students to not be able to do that at great financial penalty. That makes no sense to me. So I think there's a lot. The final message that I want to uh, leave you with is the best ideas that we have come from you. Um, it's just like Shannon. We met at a coffee shop and she told me her, her story. We came up with a series of ideas. We worked with other legislators as a group of us to pass um, some comprehensive senior safety issues. Bring them to our attention. When you are, because we can't live everywhere, we don't have all these experiences, but that is what really gives us great information and, and great hope. So if you have an idea, if you think, you know, this is ridiculous and it is done this way, or this is a failing that is this way, or whatever the case may be, please reach out to our offices. We definitely want to hear from you and try to make this session the most impactful that we can for our seniors. And thank you so very much. Thank you, Representative Johnson. And now we're going to hear from Representative Gonzalez. Um, so I, I think that we're likely to see uh, you know, that bipartisan support um, affecting, this, affecting um, older adults. You know, everybody gets older, um, despite their political ideology. Um, so I really do think that this is an area that we can come together um, you know, with the surplus that we have in uh, the budget. I hope this is one that we make a, a priority next session. Um, you know, some of the things that I that are important. Um, you know, I think that discussed here as well today by, by the folks um, that spoke earlier is making sure that we have transparency um, and properly trained dementia staff um, in the long long term care facilities. I don't know why this is not working. Um, and, and also uh, addressing food insecurity. Right? So this is one area that um, and really it was after the winter storm uh, in my district uh, but you know I think across the board in communities um, you know low income communities but then you know just for or um, you know, older adults, maybe that don't drive. Um, and so it was, it, a lot of folks weren't able to actually get out, get groceries, get fresh produce. And so I passed um, in the budget uh, last year, or last session, uh, a writer uh, that, that directs the Department of Agriculture um, to do a study on this, uh, to make sure, or you know, to, to do a study on food insecurity um, throughout the state and find these places where uh, where there is food insecurity, where folks can't buy fresh fresh produce. Um, but then also, you know, just from hearing from some of the folks earlier, um, and it also would include SNAP benefits, right? I, I had the pleasure of, of uh, um, earlier this year with the uh, Visiting Nurses Association, we went and delivered um, some meals. And so, you know, and I, and I found out while doing that, that you know, sometimes it's the, these are the only meals that, that, that the senior citizens get. Um, and so it's very important that you know we we continue to fund great programs like that, um, you know, especially since you know we know that when when folks aren't able to to you know to, to eat healthy meals or or you know that can cause long term effects, um, health effects. Um, and so some of the areas that that, that you know I like to see for is a uh, property tax uh, relief. Um, that I think would help a lot of people across the state, but then especially you know senior citizens who are on fixed incomes. Um, you know, some folks are being you know taxed out of their homes, and so you know I know this is a, an issue that we continue to talk about um, at least in the last two sessions that I've served in, um, and even when I first um, ran for office. Uh, this is an issue that's very important. And I hope that we do actually address this issue next session. This is something I'm really familiar with. <laughs> 
microphone the door. Um, but, but yes, and then increasing the wages um, of long-term care facilities. We need to make sure that, that they're able to have a livable income, that we're able to hire a quality staff um, in, you know, in these facilities. And so, um, you know, I definitely will make that a priority. You know, my parents are, are baby boomers. Um, and, 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 and so, uh, that to me is important. And, um, and then, yes, so I, you know, will be a partner with, with, with you all um, and making sure that, you know, we are able to get, to get this funding. And my friend over here who was on appropriations, hopefully we'll be on appropriations again, and we can make sure that that happens. Thank you. Next, we have Representative Retta Ambrose. <coughs> Thank you, Julie. Good to see you. Julie, fine. Good to see you. Good to see you. And good to be here on this panel um, with my classmates. Uh, we're all classmates. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, thank you. Came in together, uh, what, in the 86? Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, um, gosh, it's been a long time since I've been here. The first time I was here or had any dealings with the senior source, uh, I was a staffer for Representative Rose. And so, okay. So, um, yeah, and I remember having to help her prepare for this very form. So I want to say thank you for having me. Uh, my colleagues here today, it's a full circle moment. Um, I Thank the staff before I continue on because um, we certainly aren't the experts in every area. Um, and there's so many of you out there in this audience at all. Um, but for me, uh, priorities as we prepare for the 88th legislative session, uh, I certainly um, wanted right out the gate to go ahead and follow the Crown Act. Uh, can't do anything to say that first. Uh, Texas uh, Crown Act uh, House Bill 567 um, that may touch our seniors uh, a little bit, and I, I would think for sure um, when it comes to race based, uh, limiting race based care services. Um, and that deals with you know, our, our school age children, but also uh, in the workplace. So it does touch all ages. Um, um, the other bills that, that I would certainly prioritize would be uh, the things that, that my constituents are going to be really concerned about. I've got uh, Rolla Girl in the ski and out in the ski. Uh, fireworks is something that certainly can be booming sound with our veterans and all those members in our communities of fireworks. So I've got a fireworks confiscation bill that I've refiled as well as a time of um, last but least, I'm going to get to that in the chair. And I certainly say not least, because when I first filed this bill as a freshman in 2019, it was a broad stroke. Like, it literally just said, and Karen Mendelson, the council member, and you'll appreciate this, it literally just said, help train peace officers in my home in this community. And so, as a sophomore, I was I was a little bit disturbed because the Senate was sending it back totally different than what I sent it opening as, and I was pretty pretty proud of it. Um, but the bill and Mark, I, I'm just so grateful for the Alzheimer's uh, Association that they helped me see that there's certainly a link between homelessness. And, you know, this this bill, I think when we talk about the budget surplus that is there, uh, I certainly hope that we can look at getting some good funding. Because as Vice Chair of Homeland Security and Public Safety, I've been here with law enforcement quite a bit. And one thing they slapped us in the face of the last session is we don't need any unfunded money, right? And um, agencies, you know, there's no cookie cutter agency in law enforcement in the state of Texas. We're a big state and agencies of all different sizes. So 
we have to look at how to best help members of law enforcement deal with patients. And I, you know, I think lastly, I want to say something that led to part of this bill in dealing with counties and getting it to where it is now. We have a organization that we were able to form out in our community called the Southeast Collaboration. And many of you might have heard in the media, Julie, thanks to you guys, but um, more discussion about law enforcement really needing help when it came to the organization. Um, they, they didn't feel trained, and so that's why we wanted to address that issue. And I'm going to pass it over because that's, that's really uh, why I feel strongly about this. And, and as uh, Representative Sherman said, you know, we all hope to get there. That's one thing I wrote down that Catherine said about helping people age. Thank you. Um, so thank you again for having us here, and I'm going to move past it. So if any of you have any questions, you should have paper in front of you. Write them on down, and they are going to bring them up here, and we will go from there, and all of you, I'll, I'll give the question out and everybody can decide who wants to take it. So y'all can decide amongst yourselves who's on the hot seat. <laughs> well, we can, I'll switch it out for each question. Yes. Okay, this is we're going to get through, we're not going to have time for all of them, but we are going to get through a couple of them. Once I give it, once I read it, I'll absolutely pass it along. Okay, wonderful. So we've got about four or five questions to go through. We've got a couple about Medicaid, so I'm going to somewhat put them together uh, because I think they're all sort of along the same subtopic, so we'll start with that. First of all, why is it so difficult to expand Medicaid? Isn't it federally funded along with the state? What is the name of the bill for Medicaid? And let's start with that one. Who would like to take the Medicaid question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, y'all want to see? I'm going to take this mic here. How about that? Um, well, we could go for a long time talking about this issue. Um, so the issue is um, the state's share. So right now, what we have in our current Medicaid formula is the state pays 40%, the federal government pays 60%, but our threshold for eligibility is $18,000 a year. So if you make $19,000 a year, you're not eligible for Medicaid. And if you make $19,000 a year, you're not able to afford a doctor. So we have this huge uninsured gap. So Medicaid expansion, what does it do? It raises the threshold to $28,000 a year. And it puts the state share down to 10% and the federal government's to 90%. A no brainer. It would add almost $10 billion to our state budget. If we do Medicaid expansion. So why do they oppose it? Well, what if the state was a federal program ends? Now we have all of these new people on our Medicaid rolls. Well, we could have thought, we said, okay, fine. We put a thing in the bill that says, if for whatever reason, the federal government program ends, this ends too. Because the federal government program is not gonna end. And so, okay, well, that's all right. And then um, it's, you know, so it's a net benefit to the state, but the general consensus is, 
it's there's a, a, a section of the hard right that says they should be able to work and pay for their own health care and they don't shouldn't get a handout. It's that argument, and that's the argument that I've been met with most consistently when I've met with Republicans. Now, in fairness, nine Republicans publicly signed on to my bill. We had enough to get it passed. And you know what? Every one of them got reelected that chose to run for reelection. So, you know, there's obviously that was an issue that uh, we got to test that in the election cycle. Obviously, that didn't affect them at all. And so hopefully we'll be able to build on that. Um, and the economic opportunities in each state is overwhelming in terms of job creation and, and everything else. So, but that's really the issue. That's Medicaid expansion by the number. Okay, one more Medicaid question and then we'll move on. What is being done to increase the Medicare Medicaid reimbursement rates to skilled nursing facilities to support better staffing ratios and better staffing ratios? So in our bill, it requires Medicaid rates to go to Medicare parity. So that would have a significant increase in reimbursement rates. Uh, because part of the, another one of the objections is well, we don't have enough physicians to care for all the people in Medicaid. Well, under the current Medicaid rate reimbursement, that's still true. Although, you know, my wife is a physician, and I think they just as soon take anything versus nothing. There's such a huge unfunded care. The hospitals get a waiver program for the 15 waivers, but the physicians don't. And so that's really kind of where the problem goes as well. But the bill would require Medicare parity on rates. So that will do a lot right there just to bring rates up. We have tons of physicians that participate in Medicare and that I think would also participate in Medicaid at the same reimbursement level. Okay. My understanding is that currently background checks for workers and facilities and home health are only for Texas. Would like to see requirements expanded to other states. They and is there any chance for a federal database consisting of information from every state if someone comes to work at a nursing, uh, a skilled nursing facility? Is that a question for you, Shannon, or is that a question? Can we... Okay. Um, our experience is just what was decided that a background check covers history only in Texas. If you work, we get the loud <laughs> um, If you work as the convicted worker in Florida and then come to Texas, anything that you did in Florida is not in your background check. And that's one of the things that is frustrating us we don't know everything about this history and how we was able to work together. But yes, if there is a way to make it and there's a lot of interest in establishments for having it expanded nationally. So essentially, thank you for your expertise on that. And so essentially this is on the state level, you have the background checks in place, but yes. this is a federal level. So this is something actually there are twenty eight states who receive money from CMS. To, to to work on establishing a, a federal database. Of course, Texas is not one of those. So, is there any discussion of legislation to make those stricter? You know, I'm not aware of that that's really come up. This is the first I've personally heard of it, Janet. But I know that, um, you know, this this is an issue that's carried over in the, the medical board. I, I have a medical board transparency bill that requires more transparency on, on backgrounds of physicians that get disbarred or, or lose their license. It's not disbarred. I'm going to say. <laughs> lose their license in other states and then come to Texas, how that's not being disclosed. Uh, to make the medical board have to do background checks in a more comprehensive way. And penalties for physicians that fail to honestly report because uh, we have so much uh, problem there. But I'm sure that there's something compatible that we can take a look at. Yeah, there, there are, I 
multiple background check companies that can search for county, state, whatever, the whole country. But the state of Texas requirement through HHS is very low. There's two basic state-based requirements, UPS and EMR. So that definitely could be and should be raised. And is there, this is for the legislators, is there currently any consideration from the state regarding regulating boarding group homes and how to minimize exploitation of the elderly and disabled seeking housing in those homes? These are really good questions, y'all. I would not want to be the receiving end of these. <laughs> Is there currently any consideration from the state regarding regulating boarding group homes and how to minimize exploitation of the elderly and disabled seeking housing in these homes? I mean, there has been some issues on especially on community homes. A lot of the, um, um, the state supported living centers um, have been in conflict with group home situations. And so, um, especially on the funding issue, uh, and so there's some conflict on some issues there that have to be kind of sorted out. Okay, last question. Do you see the focus on older adults and long-term care residents? Do you, do you see that uh, focusing on them will help? And I'm kind of adding to this question. And, you know, do you see an increase on that this session? I mean, it's, look, it's hard to say that we have to catch it for a session yet, right? And people have it. We're still in the bill filing period. We're able to start filing bills. Yeah. And so all, all the bills haven't been filed yet. So we don't know what's going to be filed. But, but certainly, I mean, um, please contact you know one of our offices. I mean, we're always happy to, to get ideas from, from folks on legislation, uh, request a hearing on it. Um, it's a topic that we want to discuss. Um, and then, you know, work together on getting uh, folks to go down and testify, uh, getting experts to go down and you know, testify. So so certainly, um, you know, it's, it's something that could be a conversation. on with this one the senior population struggling with severe mental health issues is extremely underfunded and underserved are there currently any initiatives for expanding long-term housing options and care especially for those who have minimal funding Okay. Yeah, you start. So, um, I just, you know, with House Bill 568, I hope that it is a lesson for us all that this doesn't just have to do with law enforcement. Because we need to really look at how we're treating our age community. Um, and I was just at a legislative conference in Las Vegas. Uh, and I, I say that wanting y'all to know that there is work done at those legislative conferences. <laughs> um, but on the last day, I, I stayed to the very end, and there was a play that's coming here to Dallas, and it was called Unforgettable. And it really dealt with making you know people aware of what those <clears throat> early stages of Alzheimer's look like. 
And I'm really going to work with the Alzheimer's Association on this and make sure that you know my constituents are getting out because I do believe it's about education and awareness. Um, and that's community wide. So it just isn't about training our peace officers. And I'll add that I mean, I know there's been conversations in regards to the legislature um, you know, funding, right, mental health, uh, especially in the aftermath of what happened in the Wiley. Uh, and so I imagine that this could be across the board that we're going to invest um, in, in this uh, next session because it has been uh, talked about by uh, Republican and, Republicans and Democrats. Since we have a couple minutes left, I don't know if any of you have final remarks. Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. I just wanted to make a, a comment for Julie Johnson. Everybody talks about CRS and the seizures, the seizures. But no one remarks about retired state employees in CRS. CRS has not had any kind of cost of living increase in 18, 18 years. We, we're all going to be seniors here lining up for the food dole and a few other doles, but that's it. That's all your, that's your DMV, that's health and human services, that's social workers, state schools, all those people. Right. You know, appropriations, so I sit on appropriations, I'm on Article 2, which is in the subcommittee for health care. And, you know, last session, uh, it was my first time to be on a protest. And we had all these presentations and all these discussions, um, but we were in a COVID year and our budget was, we didn't have necessarily a surplus. We were kind of at even, we had COVID funds to spend, um, but it wasn't such that uh, we were gonna spend billions of dollars to make all of this actuarially sound. We have a huge problem, you're right, with ERS, TRS care, all, all of it. And we need billions and billions of dollars to put in there. Um, fortunately, we have billions and billions of dollars. Um, what's happened with the inflationary pressures that have been all of our, on all that we've all seen, have elevated our sales tax revenues exponentially. And uh, Texas sales tax has gone through the roof in terms of revenue to the state. And we're going to have a political fight over what to do with all that money. It's un, it's just mind-blowing how much we have. We also are going to have to deal with a constitutional spending cap because right now we're not constitutionally able to spend it all because we have a cap of what we can spend. So that's going to have to be an issue to allow us to even spend it, which is crazy, but yeah. And so there's going to be two issues that are going to come down. So Greg Abbott campaigned very hard on putting at least 50% of it towards property tax deduction. What does that look like? Does that mean that we're going to fund our schools to lower our, our school property taxes? Does that mean that we're going to cut cities tax rates? You know, what does that mean exactly? What does that look like? But what that does not include is funding ERS, funding retirement, putting the making all of those, putting substantial payments, you know, there's going to be a lot of us that want to say, okay, look, we need to go put $4 billion in ERS. We need to go put another $4 billion in uh, providing a COLA and putting a substantial investment. There's going to be a lot of concern in the legislature on approach about, are we going to do single use expenditures? Or are we going to do ongoing expenditures? Single use expenditures are going to be able to do because we don't know if we're going to have the same budget surplus two years from now. We obviously didn't have it two years ago, but we have it right now. And so, to me, shoring up some of the state's obligations is a great way to spend that single use. If we can fund and make these things uh, actuarially sound where they can uh, have the resources to provide all this, it's not necessarily, it is an ongoing commitment. Because once you raise it all, you have to the state has to commit to paying it. But if we fund it up front, it'll invest the money and it should be able to cover. But it's going to be it's a, it's a it's again it's how loud are you going to be? Where do you want your state money spent? And what's the you know the budget is the moral document of the state. Where you spend your money 
says where your priorities are. And right now, our state priorities have not been in caring for our senior citizens across the board on all these topics we talked about. We would have not invested the way that we need to. So which is one of the reasons why Medicaid expansion is so important because that's a revenue income to the state. That gives us the, the funding and the resources to do a lot of these programs. You know, I have a budget writer to on um, mental health to answer that last question, which is we have a huge shortage of psychiatrists and mental health professionals in the state. It's ridiculous to do GME funding um, for to encourage more people to go into psychiatry because we don't have enough physicians practicing in that area. It's a crisis. It's an epic crisis at where we are right now. So we don't have enough providers. So there's a lot of issues, but I hope that you'll use your collective voice. This is my part of comment. I hope you use your collective voice to really advocate for all these policies. It's one thing to have these forums, which is really great, but it doesn't do anything if you don't take that, take the energy from these forums and then go advocate for it. You've got to go next level with your membership, with the people in your sphere of influence, to get involved, communicate with all the members, with all your legislators to say just how important this is because we need your support, we need your voice, we need the activism of the people to make this happen. Thank you, Representative. And any other closing remarks? My colleague, Julie Johnson, just said, you know, be willing to come down and see us. Um, be willing to come down. If you're called upon or members in your organizations are called upon to come and testify, please, we need you. Um, I certainly have uh, my district director, Kimmy Guzman, is here in the back. and. She'll be glad to share our office information um, and get your contact information because we will be calling upon you. Um, we can't do this without you all. As I said, there are many of you out there that are experts. I've, I've already got some text messages and we'll be planning a meeting with some of you already. Um, but thank you for what you said. The other, the other part about it is we just toured when, when we talked about Medicaid expansion. We are all, I think, members of the Texas House Women's Health Caucus. And um, we just toured a family health center, a community health center, right here in Dallas County, in, in Dallas, that those dollars will go to. So we're going to push hard for that. And I love what, what Julie just said. It's all about how hard you want to work and how loud you want to be. Thank you. Well, that is going to wrap us up. Can we I, really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Renee, just to talk about uh, the advocacy alert for the senior source oh, Absolutely. Sure. Because so that's the way it makes it easy for us to contact our representatives. It's almost like you were planted there. All right. And so this actually is on your slide here. We want to make it easy, and I appreciate so much the comments that you guys had. We have a really, really easy way, as Stacy mentioned, to be able to advocate for and on behalf of all of these issues. If you will take just a second to text senior source to 52886. That's on your slide, we will make sure that you are aware and that you have information on all of these important priorities. And what that will look like is you'll get a text and see advocacy alert and a little bit about Medicaid expansion or about some of these other issues. And you'll be able to just very easily with a couple clicks send an email that is, has already been crafted that you can either personalize or send as is so that it's super easy to your elected officials. It auto populates who those officials are. If this happens to be maybe a bill that's in committee and we want to reach out to all of those committee members, we set that up on the back end so it's already set up and ready to go to the appropriate legislators. So super easy we're excited about this we know older adults issues are vitally important in this upcoming session and so we want our voices to be heard we want you guys to hear all of us and our passion on all of these important issues so 
There is the text, what you say, where you text it. If you have any questions at all, please let me know or anyone on our team. So, very much. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to all of our representatives and to the staff. And we appreciate your time. So, thank you. Thank you.